At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, When you shall hear of wars and seditions, be not terrified. These things must first come to pass, but the end is not presently yet. In your patience you shall possess your souls. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel for Saints Cornelius and Cyprian, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In theology, we have an important principle for understanding the salvation of man. It is this. What is not taken up by Christ is not redeemed by Christ. What is not taken up by Christ is not redeemed by Christ. That comes out of the mouth of the fathers. Beautifully said. All that we need to be saved flows from Christ. And from his life among us on earth, thus we kneel and genuflect that, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. As he himself said to the apostle St. Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Once again, what is not taken up by Christ is not redeemed by Christ. Now, this principle holds true for all time, even unto the consummation of the world, of which we heard something about in the gospel, the various events leading up to its end in the gospel today. In other words, he somehow took up all time to himself to make it redeemable. Doesn't say Paul command us to redeem the time. We are called to redeem the time. What an important lesson here there is for us today. What is important for us then is this. The Holy Mass is a recapitulation of the life of Christ. It summarizes the entire life of Christ. We relive the life of Christ in miniature at every Mass. The Mass is the perfect prayer. And what is perfect cannot be repeated, but can only be made present again. So the Mass is a representation of the life of Christ. As to perfect prayer, not only is it indeed the unbloody representation of Calvary where Christ prayed perfectly, but also an abbreviated summary of Christ's life. We will speak of this briefly in the conference today. So when we attend Mass, we are seeing Christ and Him crucified. As St. Paul told the Galatians in chapter 3, Oh, stupid Galatians, don't you have Christ publicly crucified before you? Why have you left already and gone back? You have it all in the Mass. So when we attend Mass, we are seeing the Christ reliving his life, not just in symbol, but really after the consecration. It's a representation of Calvary. He makes redeeming our day, therefore, possible. Not only our day, but the future as well. Is our time actually contained in the Mass? Yes. The fathers of the church teach us that one of the spiritual meanings of all sacred scripture is what is called the anagogical meaning, the anagogical sense, from the Greek anagoge, which means leading, the leading sense of scripture. It means that we can always see in God's divine revelation hints of future realities, eternal significance of things, leading us to our true homeland of heaven, the church triumphant above. It breaks us free from being locked into this time and place, to this world and things of the world, making us realize that all, everything is done on the backdrop of eternity. We're like on stage and the backdrop is eternity. Eternity. Divine revelation has a certain timelessness about it then. 
This is from the fathers. So according to this understanding, we keep in mind that the Mass is indeed contained in sacred scripture. Most of the Mass comes from the sacred scripture. So according to this understanding, then every passage of scripture somehow points to the eternal significance of things. And we say, first, no wonder the church wants us to be meditating on the scriptures to conquer ourselves. The church gives a plenary indulgence for this. We can meditate upon the scriptures so many minutes a day, something like 15 to a half an hour. We get a plenary indulgence if all the conditions are met. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that the most attractive, addictive, pleasurable things of the world can be conquered. How? He says they're best conquered through the hope of the glory to come. So we think about the end and we can conquer anything. Something very pleasurable is presenting itself to me and I say, just a minute, what is this to eternity? All of a sudden, it's not so attractive anymore, is it? You put it in perspective. All things are done on the backdrop of eternity. You will conquer. We heard the Book of Wisdom say in the lesson today, our hope is full of immortality. Our hope is full of immortality. Our day is full of immortality. Our week is full of immortality. Everything is done on the backdrop of eternity. King David says in the Psalms over and over, naming the Psalms. So the first verse of the Psalms is the name of that Psalm. And the first verse, by far the most popular name, is unto the end. Unto the end. Strange name. What's he saying? Think about the end. This Psalm is about getting you there. Why is the priest reading the breviary every day? so that he'll make it to the end and lead his people there. No priest goes to heaven alone. He either takes the train with them there or he takes the train with them to hell. That's the way it is. I spoke with my tongue, King David says in the Psalms. I spoke with my tongue, O Lord. Make me know my end. Make me know my end. And then he says, why does he want that? And what is the number of my days? Why? That I may know what is wanting to me, what is lacking for me to make it to that end. I want to know about it while I'm on the way. In another place, the Bible is crystal clear in the book of Ecclesiasticus. In all thy works, remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. Remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. This also must be connected to why the church offers indulgences for meditating on the scriptures, as I've mentioned. She wants us to be thinking of this most significant reality. Is it true of other divine revelation other than sacred scripture? Is it only true of the sacred scriptures? And the answer is no, it's true of sacred tradition, the liturgy. Yes, the mass is anagogical. It leads us to the end if we let it. The end is somehow present in the Mass. It looks back, yes, it captures the life of Christ and represents the most important part, His passion, death, and resurrection in real time. A door opens and we're on Calvary. But does it look to the end of all things? Is it eschatological? And the answer is yes. After all, do we not hear uh, many mysteries, mysterious statements of His Majesty at the Last Supper and beyond, such as this one found in Luke's Gospel. By the way, the Gospel today that we heard from Mass precedes the Last Supper. That's the last thing we read before we get to the Last Supper and the Passion in Luke's Gospel. Here we go. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, the next chapter. He said to His disciples after the Mass, I dispose to you, as my Father hath disposed to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and may sit upon thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's an eschatological statement. And it's right there in the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, which is represented in the Mass. 
A few more indicators. First and foremost, the Mass not only opens a doorway to Calvary, it represents Calvary in the double consecration, it also opens up a door to heaven. To the end. It is therefore unto the end. It's giving us a taste of the end. Second of all, the body and blood consecrated at Mass is the resurrected, glorified body. That's how the door to heaven is opened. Because the body present on the altar is the resurrected body. And because of that, a doorway is open to heaven. But this is indicated in the fraxio of the Mass. Remember, the priest breaks the host, and then he takes a little particle and he puts it in the chalice. That is the symbol in the Mass of the resurrection of Christ. That part of his life is relived right there. That's a symbol of the end, of the general resurrection. How about facing north for the chanting of the gospel? This symbolizes all the time in between his resurrection unto the end, where we are to preach the gospel to the nations and convert them. Another sign, the paten. The paten the priest has, he, be, he, he holds on to it with four fingers out like that. That's the four horns of the old altar. The paten itself, that's the Jews. It's the Hebrew people. They provide the matter for the Savior. Our Blessed Mother was a Jewish lady. And she provided the matter. And so the paten is the Jews. But once they see the sign of the cross made, they go, no, we don't want that. And so they're taken away. And the Jews are hidden under the corporal or in the humeral veil of the subdeacon. And their face are veiled. But what happens? After the crucifixion, the double consecration, and the paternoster, out comes the paten. It's polished. It's cleaned. It accepts the Christ now. It's the sign of the cross is made with the paten. It comes back onto the corporal and it receives the Christ back on. They have now converted. This has not yet happened. This is the future. It's contained in the Mass. Isn't that beautiful? I love that part of this Mass where we have the paten. We hide the paten. We cover it with the purificator. It's veiled. And so St. Paul tells us the Jews at this time are veiled. Their eyes are veiled. This is just eschatological. This is to the end. Contained in the Mass. Also, the missile being moved back and forth is symbolic of this as well. How about this one? The Mass is supposed to be offered facing east. It is a sign that we must be ready to welcome the Christ when He comes again. And He will come again from the east. Think here of Our Lady always coming from heaven via the east at Fatima. And she always returned the same way. Interesting, huh? Eschatological. The first Mass, the Last Supper, is celebrated, offered in the context of the Passover. It was offered in the evening, just before the ultimate act of our Lord, His laying down of His life. The Mass is the same ritual as the Last Supper. In fact, if you don't recognize the Last Supper at Mass, you might not be attending Mass should always be able to recognize the Last Supper. Whatever Mass we attend, whatever rite we go to, we must be able to recognize the Last Supper. That means the rite, the ritual being followed is the correct one. That's how we know it's valid. Well, the first Mass, the Last Supper, was offered in the evening. And so, the Mass will be offered unto the twilight of the world, the evening of the world unto the passion of the Lord's mystical body, predicted in the Bible, in the book of the Apocalypse and other places. The church will go through her persecution and ultimate crucifixion. The church militant will pass completely into the church triumphant at the end. But the mass will last unto the end itself, unto the twilight of the world. The Antichrist must publicly suppress the Mass before he's able to come into power. 
So you see how that the Holy Mass is in fact connected to the end. It's not just symbolic either. So the offertory then, put two and two together, it's the church. The offertory was Christ at the Last Supper. Now it's the church. It's us. And the fraxio represents our future resurrection. This is powerful. So just as each passage of Scripture points to the end in some way, so too it is with the Mass. It has a certain timelessness to it, the Mass does, as it captures all time and eternity as well. It is anagogical. It's leading up to the end. It's done on the backdrop of eternity, literally opening doors to heaven. The lessons here are profound. Who am I to plumb the depths? I'll give you a few. We have a chance not only to get in touch with the past, with the perfect prayer of Christ on the cross, and the same Savior reigning in heaven, so that we can be redeemed and redeem all time, but we can redeem this time and all time to the end of the world through this Mass. We have what it takes to survive any crisis. All has been taken up by the Christ to be redeemed right here in the Holy Mass. But also the church will experience what he experienced, a Passover, a past involving betrayal from high levels, Judas's, involving a falling away or apostasy in the flight of the apostles after the arrest. They were asleep at key moments. This is happening. It'll happen again. The shepherd will be struck in some way and many sheep will scatter. But the beautiful part is, I'm trying to get across, there is proven to be a reversal, a complete rout, a victory. At the end, we win. And it's right here in the Mass. With the frock seal and the resurrection, with the final blessing, the ascension, We'll win. We'll rise. Again, another lesson. Each and every action of ours ought to be done with our end in view. It ought to be done with the Mass in mind. Can I offer this action on, on the Patton tomorrow at Mass? Will it count unto the end? That needs to be asked. Can my words and actions be placed on the Patton? Will it bring glory to God in the end of all things when I stand before the seat of judgment? All our actions have eternal significance. Everything counts. Thus the saints often repeat it to themselves, what is this to all eternity? We can say, what is this to the Mass? Is this going to be offered on the patent tomorrow? I can't do that. It won't be accepted. It would be a sacrilege. I'll be betraying my Lord. No. And third of all, another lesson comes from the third secret of Fatima. It makes it make sense. Third secret of Fatima, the vision part that we received from the Vatican. If you look at it, it captures this very well. The second part where there's order, there's a Pope who's recognizable. She calls him straight away, the Holy Father. And bishops are following him and priests and religious and lay people. In the first part of the vision, the lay people were not following the bishop, priests and religious. And there was no mention of a Holy Father climbing the mountain. But all of a sudden he got this great order. It's all ordered. It's going up a mountain. This is our mountain. At the top is a cross. There's our cross. The sacrifice is acceptable to God. The angels are there receiving the blood of the martyrs as they're killed formally by execution squads. All their offering counts unto eternity. The blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. This is possible. This is the Mass it's describing. 
All these good people climbing the mountain in an orderly way and offering themselves completely to the Christ crucified. The result, the conversion of the world. One flock, one shepherd in a triumph of Mary's immaculate heart. Dearly beloved, we have something here in this Mass that is profound, that is unto the end, that is of eternity. Let us take advantage of it and gain the victory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.